finishing up last week's message, and I wanted to just camp out for a couple of more minutes on one point that I want to make absolutely clear just before we dive into Matthew chapter 2. What things do you think are important for us to teach our children in our generation? What disciplines should I allow my child to choose for him or herself? Remember last week, I quoted briefly from a columnist, and she said she was wondering if perhaps she was robbing her children of something by not raising them in a community of faith. And there's a pervasiveness in our nation today of people who say, well, I'm just going to let my kids grow up and figure it out for themselves. I'm going to let them choose what religion they want to have, if they want any religion, and unfortunately, many are choosing no religion at all. So what discipline should I allow my children to choose for him or herself? Let me get just super simple in an analogy. First of all, would you teach your children how to brush their teeth? Do you think that's an important discipline? Or what would happen if we said, you know, honey, I know it's such a pain to have to brush your teeth. And that crest is so minty that if you don't like it, you know, just you'll figure it out. When you grow up, you'll figure it out. Well, I have a daughter who has two grandbaby boys of ours, and they don't like to brush their teeth terribly often. Sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get them to brush their teeth. And she'll hand them the toothbrush, and she's tried to get the cool colors and the stuff that tastes like bubble gum, you know, and all this stuff. But finally, with the four-year-old, she showed some pictures of people and what they look like when you don't brush your teeth. And our four-year-old went, ew. Well, that's gross. And she said, well, you don't want to have a ew kind of mouth, so you need to brush your teeth. There are consequences if we don't teach certain disciplines. How about this one? Healthy hygiene. What if you allowed your kid to just play wherever they wanted to play, roll around in the dirt? If it was yesterday, they'd be rolling around in the mud because this was living water day at living water. <laughs> And then when they got home, you could say, you know, I know that it's such a pain to have to get in the bathtub, and so if you want to just climb into those nice clean sheets the way you are, no big deal. Do you think we would want to teach some discipline to our kids? Now, let me tell you, it's not just healthy for them to teach them how to have good hygiene and how to take a shower or a bath once in a while, but man, you just wait until they're in about the seventh grade. And the hormones kick in and the sweat glands are going overtime and they go out to physical education on a hot day and they come back in. Woo! I'm telling you what, you're going to want them to take a bath. Or how about money management? Do we want to have our kids growing up believing that money just grows on trees? I think that it was one of our youngsters, may have been Katie, I'm not sure which, at one point thought that she wanted something, and I said, honey, we don't have enough money for that. And she goes, but you have checks. (laughs) Just write another check. She thought it was a magic piece of paper. All you had to do was write some numbers on that piece of paper and give it to somebody and you could buy stuff. Do you think it's important that we teach our kids the basic rule of economic reality, which is, oh, I don't have any money. (laughs) that's the reality I was going to hold up a dollar bill I was going to say if you spend it here you can't spend it over here that's a basic reality amen now if we teach our children that and if we help them understand some money management principles they will be much better off as they grow older my parents started very simply with learning how one-tenth of the money, according to Scripture, belongs to God. And so they would pay my allowance in dimes. I had ten dimes, and they would show me that I set the one aside and that I don't even treat it like it belongs to me because it doesn't. That one goes to God. And I would put it in my little envelope, write my name on it. I'd go to Sunday school class, and I'd put it in a little basket, and I would give my tithe every week. It's a lot easier to learn how to give a tenth of your income when you only make a dollar a week than it is when you get to be an adult and you have a huge salary. And so, folks, disciplines are important. How about this one? Sharing. Do you think that we could just allow our kids to grow up and figure out whether they should share or not? Or do you think that's going to take a little effort on our parts? I'm a parent, and I'm a grandparent, and I'm here to tell you, it takes effort to teach children how to share because it does not come naturally for them to want to share. 
The first five years is crucial in that developmental phase, by the way, for all of these things. So why, do we would, why would we think that it's not important to teach them about spiritual disciplines if we think these other very practical things are extremely crucial for us? I think the stakes are much higher spiritually than they are even physically because they last forever. How will our loved ones face spiritual battles and temptations if they're left to just, quote, figure it out for themselves? God's Word has something to say about that, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 10. But remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. And when you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you will not give in to that. You can't say that that's true if you haven't developed spiritual disciplines in the life of our young people. And so to that columnist, I would say, ma'am, you're on the right track. I just urge you to follow through on what you're discovering and share it with the world. It is vital that we establish spiritual foundations for our children in our country today. We're also given specific instructions about teaching those we love, about God's boundaries and his rules, the way he has established his created order. And we see that in Deuteronomy 6. It's a passage we quote from every time we do a baby dedication. It comes from a time when God was preparing his children of Israel. They had been slaves. This is Egypt right here. They'd been slaves over here in Egypt in bondage under the tyrannical thumb of a Pharaoh being told what they should do, when they should do it, how they should do it, keep working harder. God finally delivers them with his mediator Moses and he's leading them out trying to prepare them to live life under his authority rather than under the authority of the Pharaoh. And he tells this stuff in Deuteronomy. Impress these laws or these boundaries of mine on your children, he says. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. That's pretty much all day. Everything that you do should be an example to your children and you should have conversations with them at every opportunity to establish my boundaries for their life so that their life can go better for them. And God even instructed the people to have an answer for their children when their children say, oh, mom, dad, why do we have to do this stuff? As every child will ask. (laughs) When I I was a child, my dad was pretty hard-nosed about keeping the Sabbath separate from the other days of the week. He had grown up that way. And I and my sister were not allowed to go outside and play on Sunday afternoons with the other kids in my neighborhood. So we said, what did you do? We read the comics together. We read books together. We rested. And then we went back to church on Sunday night because that's what we did. And I grew up thinking that was normal because my parents made it normal. Now today we would think, oh, that's just oppressive. How could you possibly keep your children from playing? My imagination went crazy because I had time to think. Sometimes we need to slow our kids down into real time and give them opportunities for their imagination to kick in. And it's okay for them to see that resting is an activity. And it's an activity prescribed by God because Sundays should be set aside. I'm afraid we didn't do as good a job with our own children probably at times as my parents did with me because we get sports and we have other things that creep in and start to make weekends extremely busy. You know what? I don't think I suffered that much. I think I turned out okay. (laughs) God is telling his people in Deuteronomy 6 that if you'll do these things, if you'll establish these boundaries of mine with your younger people, with the children that you're raising up, the next generation, if you want to have things go badly for them, just let them walk away from it. Don't teach them these things. Stop training your children to obey God if you want things to go poorly for them. On the flip side, the positive side, if you want them to go well, train your children in the ways of the Lord. Give them every opportunity you possibly can to choose to follow in the way of Jesus Christ. Give them every possibility. They can still choose to reject it because that's free will. But at least they'll have all the knowledge available to them so that hopefully if we pray them into that, they'll make the right choice and choose to follow Christ. Parents, This is a solemn challenge from God's Word. Train your children in the Word. 
Now, let's look at today's text. I invite you to read silently along with me in your Bible as I read aloud. Let's stand in honor of the reading of this word. Verses 1 through 12 of Matthew 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, and you could picture him going, yeah, 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 report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Yeah, right. Now after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went on ahead of them until it stopped or appeared to stop over the place. That's retrograde motion for those of you who have looked at that DVD that we gave out at Father's Day. Stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. You know what this passage reminds us of right off the bat, just at first glance? We've got to share the gospel with all people because we cannot humanly predict who is going to respond to the message and who's going to reject it. Those that we least expected in Scripture to honor God and follow Jesus did so. We wouldn't have expected the Magi to do that. And I'll tell you why in a couple of moments. This passage contrasts the three main characters in this event and shows us how we can identify with the good guys in the story, this true event, this historical event. First of all, we see that Herod actually sought Jesus' death. We know that he was trying to get word from those magi to send it back because he wanted to kill Jesus. Jerusalem's religious leaders, they were just ambivalent. They could care less. They're thinking, he's just a baby. What do we have to do with him? They really didn't recognize that all these scriptures that they were fairly familiar with, familiar enough to be able to tell the Magi what the prophecies were, and yet they didn't go with the Magi to go worship this king. They were loyal to somebody else. And then the Magi, these people from the east, these pagans, non-Jewish people, Gentiles, came and worshiped the king of kings, Jesus. God surprises us, doesn't he? By choosing people we might not expect to accomplish his will. As I read Matthew's account, I find myself quickly wanting to identify with the Magi. I would think, oh yeah, I want to be with those guys. If I were back in those days and if I had seen the star and if I'd read the prophecies, I would want to be smart enough to say, I know what this means. Get me a camel. I'm going with them. We're going to Bethlehem. I want to worship. I don't know if I would have been or not but I want to identify with them. Interesting thing, true story about a friend of mine. His name is Joe. He lives in the same city where we've been living for the last 20 plus years. Joe uh, has a counseling degree. He's a smart fellow, very intelligent, very well read, had a stack of books in his house on the occult. Because before he became a believer in Jesus, he was checking out all kinds of different religions and he went through his occult phase where he was just trying to figure out what is this Wiccan Uh, Are there some black arts and dark arts? And are there some good things that I should be investigating spiritually? Uh, What kind of discernment spiritually should I have? Can I do divination? What's all that stuff? So a friend of his, who was actually a chaplain in the county jail, strong believing Christian, started to befriend Joe. They had a lot of things in common. And Joe invites this guy 
to come into his house one time. Now, let me show you how it could have gone had this friend been like a lot of believers that I know. He could have walked in and said, hey, Joe, what do you have on your bookshelf? We got to burn these right away. Where's a barrel? I, I can't come into your house anymore. You've got all this filth in here. What are you doing? But instead, the guy's name was Steve. Steve walked in, noticed the books on the shelf, just kept the conversation flowing. He didn't cast judgment on Joe. And over time, Steve got to know Joe well enough to be able to say, would you mind if I shared my experience, my story with you? And Joe says, of course. And because he had earned the right to share his story, Steve told him how Jesus Christ had changed his life drastically. And then he started studying God's Word, and God's Word started to change him because that's the way God speaks to us. And so Steve said, my life will never be the same. And I just want to recommend the same path to you because I found that Jesus wasn't kidding when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He meant it because he did everything he could to show us how much God loves us, and he's changed my life. Long story short, Joe gave his heart to Christ because of Steve. And then when Joe started studying God's word and recognized, "Uh uh-oh, I've been doing some things I shouldn't have been doing because the Bible clearly forbids divination. He doesn't want me to dive into the occult. So Joe got rid of the books. He threw them away. Not because Steve went in there and cast them out, but because Steve loved him to Christ and Christ gave Joe the truth and Joe acted on the truth. You see the difference? Sometimes we can't predict who's going to come to faith in Christ and who's not, but we have to share it with love, knowing that God's the one who brings the results. So here are a couple of things that Matthew does for us. He challenges our prejudice against outsiders to the faith. I don't know about you, but when I was a freshman in college, I thought I knew a lot more than I knew. And I thought that we had to sort of draw lines in the sand and that we had to stay clearly on one side of the line and we'd lob these little grenades of truth across the dividing line between truth and those people who didn't follow the truth. But the longer I went through college seeing these wonderful Christian people who loved their neighbors and invested their lives in their lives, the more I recognized, you know, they're being more like the Christ I read about in the New Testament than about those Pharisees and those religious leaders. Another thing we see in Matthew, Cyrus at that time, the king of the Persians, was calling himself the king of kings. And yet the Bible clearly was teaching us that there's going to be another person who will be the king of kings who will reign forever and whose kingdom will never end. In fact, we see that in Daniel as God revealed that to Daniel in a vision. Daniel 7, in my vision, Daniel says, at night, I looked up and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. And he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now you think about all the kings that have come since Cyrus. Jesus Christ is still reigning today and will continue to reign forever and ever because he is the one talked about in this. With a silence of 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we talked about the waiting, such a long period of time, how astounding it would have been for those who got it. The Magi got it. And they were pagans, but they saw the truth and responded to the truth. The Magi did not behave in the way that we would have expected. In the Old Testament, they were Daniel's enemies. They were the bad guys. These were the people that were kind of like the mercenary prophets. They would say things just because they wanted to stay on the king's good side. If the king said, I need a prophecy that's going to say that this people that we're going to go up in war against, they're going to lose and we're going to win. Can you say that? Sure. We can do that. Pay me a little more money. I can give you any kind of prophecy you want. The Magi were not good guys back then in the Old Testament. And yet, they're the good guys in Matthew. We can see that they saw the truth and they responded to it. Although the Bible clearly taught against divination and telling the future, Deuteronomy 18, which included astrology, by the way, for one special event in history, God used his own created order to reveal something magnificent and he revealed it to the people who are looking at the stars. 
Uh, it wasn't until about the 16th or 17th century when those two sciences of astrology and astronomy started to separate. Back here, it was all done for the purpose of trying to foretell the future. They saw that all messed together. Today, we have a science that appears to that, and they, they almost look at astrology as being something that's a pseudoscience. It's not even worth the effort. But back then, they were both together. And yet, God chose something to speak to these guys in a language they would understand to reveal something, and they responded to that truth. God sometimes reveals truth to people in the most unique ways and in ways that we would think, he can do that? He can reveal truth through that movie that we watched? He could reveal truth through a pagan, through a non-believer who says something that's still God's truth, but they just don't recognize they've said it? Yeah. He can, because he's God, and he can reveal truth any way he wants to, so that ultimately his eternal purposes can be accomplished. Matthew also challenges us to share the truth about Jesus with everybody. My mom and I watched a movie together when she was still alive. I went to Phoenix to visit her. It was when the Nativity story first came out, and we watched it on the big screen. And it was such a neat moment for me to share with my mom, because my mom and dad had taught my sister and me the truth about the birth of Jesus. And they taught that it was a real historic event and all that that meant to us was so special. There's one scene where they really got the movie right. And I could see that my mom was just kind of misting up a little bit as she watched that. It was the time when these magi had arrived in Bethlehem and they start to get up and present their gifts. One by one, they climbed down off their camels. That, this would have been a big caravan. This was not three guys in a smart car. We're talking a big caravan with a lot of entourage, some people to help carry all their baggage and set up their tents at night. I mean, this is a big deal. When they came into Jerusalem, they probably created quite a stir. And so the first gets off, and he says, gold for the king of kings. Okay, that's neat. The next one says, frankincense for the priest of priests. That's kind of neat, too. And then the third, his voice trembling, says, a gift of myrrh to honor the sacrifice. That was the moment. That was the moment in the movie that gave us that lump in our throat because the honor of sacrifice was something that in the movie they captured, they clearly understood there was something bigger, some big picture in mind with the birth of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. There's a tree called Comifora Murrah. Here's a picture of that tree. Does that look familiar at all to you? Can you see the thorns it's usually small enough, nimble enough branches that it could be formed into a thorn of crowns. But it also has in the middle portion beyond the bark, if you wound that tree, it will bleed a sap that turns into resin. And it's really sweet smelling. They would use it partially for embalming, sometimes for healing properties. And you could wound the tree over and over again so that you could see stripes around the bark for people who had bled that sap to get the healing properties. And there's such a huge connection with what we read in Isaiah where it says, but he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. It's no accident that they choose myrrh to honor the sacrifice of this king of kings. The magi received the revelation from God and they responded to it and worshiped Jesus. To the religious leaders who had become complacent with business as usual, Jesus was just another baby born in a no-name town, not worth their time. I remember another guy named Craig that I met and he reminded me a little bit of these magi. He was a wise fella, he was well-read, he's very intelligent, but boy, he was not wanting anything to do with Jesus or the Bible studies. This was in New York where we lived for just a year. He had been invited by some people that he really respected to a home Bible study. And they said, what we do is we sit around in the living room after we've had some snacks. And he thought, snacks are good. He said, we sit around, we drink coffee, we look at the Bible together, we have some questions. It's an inductive Bible study, which means we ask good questions, and then all of us look to the Word for the answers to those questions, and then we interpret and apply so that we can start to see how this Word takes shape. Would you like to come and share in something like that with us? He said, no, 
probably four or five times. And because he respected the person who was inviting him, Craig, who was a well-respected businessman in New York, finally said, all right, but he had a caveat. If anybody calls me brother or puts their hand on my shoulder, I'm out of there. Because he had this stereotype in his mind about what Christians were probably going to be like. He went to this Bible study. There were other intelligent, thoughtful, thinking people in the room. The snacks were pretty good. He kept noticing that his friend's Bible had all these different colored highlights, and it was really dog-eared and well-read. And he was impressed by that because he thought, this person has really taken this seriously. This is not just some armchair, uh, read-a-verse-a-day kind of person. They're really diving into this thing. This means something to them. And after several weeks of going through the book of Mark, inductively looking at God's word, they started comparing all the different people who were in Mark's gospel. And when it came to the point when finally people had to respond to him and either reject him or accept him as Christ, Craig said, the light bulb went on. (laughs) I got it. God's word did speak to me. Jesus is who he says he was, and he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. Craig went on to become a board member for Neighborhood Bible Studies an organization that trains people how to do inductive Bible studies all across America. Who knew? He was like the Magi. We cannot predict who's going to reject Jesus and who's going to accept him, but it's up to us to extend the invitation to everybody, recognize everyone, and communicate hope. Because God, when he gets a hold of somebody's heart, can surprise even the believers who thought, I never saw that one coming. I thought they were incorrigible. I never would have thought they would have turned to Christ. But look what a wonderful testimony they're leading in their lifestyle right now. So here's the challenge. It's tough, isn't it, to live in that healthy tension where we've got to hate sin and love sinners. Jesus did it extremely well. We find it more difficult. (laughs) And yet, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Even if people push back against what we believe, we can't shy away from the truth, and we've got to share the truth with love, knowing that God can respond through his spirit to somebody's heart with the seeds of truth through God's word that we're spreading and planting. And we don't know who's going to receive it and who's going to reject it. Will we be that kind of people? That's what Matthew asks us in his gospel. Are we going to be the people who will keep reaching praying for God's Holy Spirit to bust a move in people's hearts. And I say, from the evidence that I've seen, yeah. I have total faith that you're going to be that kind of people, that you're going to continue to study God's Word, to let God transform your spirit, and the fruit of His Spirit is going to be evident and shown to those people around you so they can get drawn to Jesus in you. Let's do that together. Let's pray. Father, we desperately need the power of your Holy Spirit at work in our hearts if we're going to be those kinds of people. And yet I have total confidence that you're still at work. The same power that's in us today was that power at work, even in the Magi, that led them to embrace truth. And I pray for people who are walking in darkness all around us. Maybe they're having a tug of war in their own spirit because your Holy Spirit is already tugging at their hearts and they don't even recognize it because they don't recognize what conviction looks like. But I pray that we'll be the kind of people who will rise up, that we'll reach out, we'll repent of our own sins, and we'll keep reaching with the truth of Christ so that lost people can get found, people walking in darkness will see the light, people who are dead in their sins will become new creations and come alive in Jesus Christ. And I pray that that will happen as we become a church on the offensive and not on the defensive. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who makes it all possible. Amen.